What are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? Mike, it's so good to see you. And I want to immediately jump right into the question I had for you that I emailed to you previously. And so I'm going to take us into the room. Uh, you invited, when I worked at LexisNexis, you're the CEO of LexisNexis. When I, when, when I was working there, you invited me as well as probably between 12 and 15 other high performers and managers and leaders within the business for a round table. And I know you do these constantly. And this was back when we were able to meet in person. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want to talk about a skill that you have that I think would be beneficial for others to work on developing. And that's this. We got in that meeting and you asked questions to each person around the table. And I watched you intently listen to the answers of each person. You took a few notes, but you weren't trying to write everything down verbatim. Um, just a few. And then as after we got done, prior to us adjourning the meeting and leaving, you went person by person, distilled the messages by person to their essence, and then shared them back as well as action plans. And it blew my mind. And your ability to listen and understand and care and distill and then share is something I think would be valuable for people to learn how to do. And so first, can you take us back into the way you think about those rooms and those round tables and how you are an active listener and why it's so important for you to then distill those messages and share them back with others. So I really wanna get your framework for how you behave in these instances. Sure, happy to do it, Ryan. And uh, great to connect with you again, as always. Yeah. Um, and thanks for that, you know, that, that sort of introduction of that. Um, I think maybe you, you might be mythologizing a little bit. The, the, you I don't know, think so, man. Way, I'm telling you, I don't think so. Because I have to tell you, if you talk to my family, they certainly probably wouldn't put me up in, in the top even 50% of active listeners. But uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I, I do believe it's, a, it's an important um, thing to develop in business. And it's something I've worked on. And the... the um, the process you talk about, about getting together with 10, 15 people uh, is something I do on a, on a regular basis all the time uh, in the business. Matter of fact, I just did that uh, yesterday with a group and I shared the results back today. So it's, it's part of the normal operating cadence in, in the business. And so the question is, you know, first of all, why, why do that before we get into, you know, how, to, how I've thought about structuring those, those sessions, et cetera. The why for me is, um, two reasons really um you know we are fundamentally a a people business we at lexus nexus are fundamentally a people business we have ten thousand colleagues around the world and we are only as good as our ten thousand colleagues and keep our customers happy and motivated and motivated to come back and to purchase with us and so for me it's a priority to get to know people one-to-one -one. and you know that's that's not easy with 10,000 people, but you can actually do it. Um, and ironically, you can do it even easier now in this medium now, now that everybody's on video, I can spend time with people in Hong Kong or India that, you know, without having to travel there. So it's actually remarkable, but it's, it's being able to understand our people, get to know them better, get to see how they're looking at the world, what's on their mind, what are the issues and problems they have, number one. Number two, it's, how do I keep my finger on the pulse of the business in an effective way that's close to the customer? So you might be surprised to know that by the time information comes to me, and that's probably true of just about any business leader, right? Information gets filtered and packaged and put on nice little neat PowerPoint slides. <laughs> Guess what they all say? Everything is perfect. Good Everything's A-OK -okay over here. Mike, you should go spend your time in India. That's where the problems are. You know, here in Dayton, Ohio, everything's going great, you know? Um, so I like to get to, with people and hear what they have to say. And when we have issues and problems, which is normal in a business, get those out on the table and then find out how we can put the resources in place to address them or remove obstacles, uh, et cetera. 
So getting to your, your question, the part of your question about how, you know, things, I've sort of structured these, it's evolved over, over time. I, I started doing these years ago. Um, and what I found is helpful in it is, you know, first of all, the number of people, 10 to 15 is about right. You get more than 15 and you can't really effectively listen to people. You get fewer than, than 10 and the dialogue isn't quite as rich because half of the, 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 the interesting thing about the meeting is just it gives people a chance to hear from people they wouldn't otherwise hear from. And so it's a learning experience for the people in the room uh, as well. So I think, you know, the 10, 10 to 15 uh, uh, um, people. Number two, I try to get it as close to the front line as possible. Um, ideally, people who are directly interacting with the customer. Um, although I do a lot of these, I, I try to make sure I get a healthy sampling of that so I can, I can hear what our people are hearing from our customers. So obviously, it's important to talk to the customers too, but uh, that's an important part of the equation. And then the, the, the next dimension is, all right, well, how do, you, how do you structure the session to make it, to make it effective? Um, and so what I try to do is, first of all, just get to know people and, um, um, and, and make it as casual and easy and relaxed as possible because and the, the purpose of that really is one to get to know people but two it's to make people comfortable and and feeling that this is a totally safe environment to throw out any idea criticism critique etc so i go around and people introduce themselves and i usually ask for them to share something unique or special or exciting about them and that just breaks the ice a little bit and gets people sharing and talking and um and then if you can add on to anything that they say uh, or ask an interesting question as a follow up to them. It just makes people feel comfortable. Then the question is, all right, well, how do you get people talking about the business? And so here I've evolved and, in, in, um, you know, I, I started by asking very specific questions that would put sometimes people on the defensive. Uh, it would narrow the conversation. So I've really evolved into just asking people to share their perspective on what's going right and what's going wrong, right? That's something that everybody has an opinion on. Everybody can add to. It's not an intimidating question. And yet it's something that, that pulls out and draws, um, you know, out issues and problems and challenges and what's going right. Because you want to know what's going right because you want to be able to do more of that. And you want to know what's going wrong because, you know, our ability as business leaders to succeed is depends on finding out what's going wrong early and soon and then being able to take actions to, um, uh, to you know, to get ahead of it. Um, you talked to, in, in your in your, in your introduction. You said, "Okay, I didn't take too many notes." Um, so that's something I've also learned over time, which is I usually ask for one person to take notes in the session, and it's not for purpose of taking down anybody's name. And we make that clear. The purpose is just simply that. If there is an issue or an obstacle that we want to raise and surface, somebody can capture that and summarize it. And we, we circulate that around and that, that's an ability to then follow up on, on those things uh, as we go. Now, the next thing is once the dialogue starts happening and people start throwing out things that are going well and things that are not going well, oftentimes the inclination I had early on, if something's not going well, Usually you probably may already know about it. And the inclination is to say, oh yeah, but we're working on that over here. Or John in this division has got a major initiative focus on that. Or, and that's exactly what you do if you want to shut down all conversation, yeah. right? <laughs> if, you, if you are the problem solver in this meeting, um, and if you're the guy who's got all the answers, if this suddenly becomes a Q&A with Mike it's not really accomplishing your objective of listening and drawing and finding out what's actually going on. So for me, I have to rein in my instincts and not solve all the problems. I have to save up what I'm going to say to the last really five to seven minutes of, 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 uh, of what I do. And so I, I listen. And what I try to do is, you know, I'm actually really interested in hearing about the obstacles and the challenges. I'm not really that interest in hearing about all the great things that people are going to say. I'm, I'm really trying to just tease out what's what's not working right. And so when people, you know, they always start with things that are going great. 
because they want they want to be everybody wants to be positive, right? But when things when they start to talk about things or not, then I try to tease up and I just try to ask some follow up questions. Anybody want to add to that? Any of a different perspective on that? And that draws it out a little bit more. And then um, I try to um, to keep a, a mental note of it, knowing that and I the pressure is off me because I know I've got somebody else taking notes. And then once we've had a good discussion and dialogue around it, at the end, then that's where I try to come in and summarize, as you as you pointed out in that uh, in that meeting. Um, and I, I will take down just you know one to I'll jot down one to two word themes at the end. I will try to connect names of people um, to to themes. And you know I'm a big fan of Dale Carnegie and um, his books. And one thing that he says in his book, you know, How to Win Friends and Influence People, is that the greatest sound that anybody ever hears is their name. Right, Ryan? Right? Mm -hmm. And if you say somebody's name, they that has meaning. So what I try to do at the end is go around. And by, by the way, we have name tags usually when I do these in, in person. So it's, it makes it a little easier on me. Um, but I try to relate back themes that people had expressed and then in the last five minutes, I know many of these things we're trying to work on, we're tackling, we have people, then I'll just summarize what those are and I'll summarize the direction of the company and really one feeling I want to leave people with. And that's the formula that I've come to, you know, it's evolved and it's been tweaked um, over years, but that's the formula I've come to to help get my finger on the pulse of what's going on, get to know people better, um, and shape what we work on based on what people are feeling in the field. Are there certain uh, techniques? A long-winded answer. Yeah, I no, I love it. I love it, man. I, I mean, I have a full page of notes. Are there certain techniques that you've worked to develop to increase your memory skill or remember the word or the theme with a specific person? Because what I remember as someone who was in one of those seats was the I remember I, I I spoke with friends and colleagues at Lexus and and I said you know I thought Mike was an impressive guy and then I go to this meeting and I was blown away by how smart he was by how much he seemed that he cared by how well he listened and how much he remembered and when he went through the room so I, I'm, I'm thinking there's a leader listening or watching Mike that might say well, how, how can I get, how can, how can I create better memory in this distillation skill or pattern recognition, which I feel like you have, is it a repetition thing uh, or is it a combination of things? I'm wondering how have you gotten, gotten so good at this? Well, let's see. First of all, thank you for all the compliments, Ryan. <laughs> well, that's why I wanted to have this conversation. I, I, I feel like I'm going to burst your bubble here, right? Which is, I'm actually not that good and not that smart. Um, that if you do enough of these that what, ha what happens is the themes become similar. So most of the themes probably we talked about in that meeting, most, I probably had already heard of in other meetings many times. And so I might've seemed really smart and, but, but it was really because I'd seen these many times and, and I'm aware of them already. And for that group, it might seem like it's the first time we're talking about this, but, um, Always there'll be 20% new, but there's 80% I've probably heard before. I can fit it into patterns if you do if you do enough of these. I think you know the 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 key is to um, just jot down a couple words. You know, you only need a couple just to remind you in, in when in your wrap up a couple words on each theme, and then importantly a name of a person who is really highlighting that. That then and then it's just simple. You can. You can just go back to your themes and you can relate it back to the person. And, um, and then your, your, your wrap up is usually 80% the same of what you always say. So gotcha. you know, is, I, I kind of feel like I'm, you no, know, I'm no, no, I think, I think what, what it says <laughs> though, is, me out to be more than I, I am. I <laughs> no, no. What I'm, what I think I, I take from that too is, you have to put in the work and the repetitions, like a lot of things in life. Uh, you know, if you're a pro professional basketball player, you get to the gym early and work on dribbling with your left hand or whatever it may be. That's the sense I get is that part of what may has developed a skill for you is actually the 
repetitions of doing it. I, I have this question too. I'm lucky to speak with a lot of CEOs. Mike is a part of what I do. Do you, do you have like a group of CEOs where you, you go off and to meet or, and you guys share these types of skills or these ideas, Hey, you should do these round tables, 80%. You'll hear the same, take a few notes, make sure someone's over there, use their name. Like, do you, are you a part of CEO groups or senior leadership groups where you help one another out to say, this is something that I've been doing and it's really helpful. I, I'm curious about this when it comes to learning from others who have a similar job to you, because the number of people who have a job like yours is is just a, a fraction of a fraction of people, the CEO yeah. of a giant company. So I yeah. wonder how you're able to get help from others who have maybe a similar job. That is a great question. Yes, I am part of a CEO group. And let me talk about that in, yeah. a, in a minute. But one one other point I wanted to make about the, the actual evolution of that meeting form that I that one one thing that was very helpful for me in the beginning, I had an I had a coach. I had a coach that was Hired actually by the company. I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> I probably needed a lot of work, uh, probably still do. But one thing that the, the coach actually sat in on these sessions, multiple sessions, this is early in my career and watched me do these things and, and really opened my eyes to, I thought I was accomplishing something and I thought the words I was saying were being received in a certain way. And, and he basically came back and said, Mike, do you realize absolutely not you know you're shutting down conversation you're you're trying to answer and solve all these problems and in doing that you are preventing yourself from gathering information that that was uh, invaluable and by the way you, everybody can have a coach you don't have to have one hired you can have you know somebody in hr do it you can have a trusted confidant do it if this is something you're interested in if this is a technique you're interested in, in doing now um, to your point about um um peer groups yes i am part of a um a CEO discussion group or a CEO meeting group. It's comprised of about 30 or so technology CEOs. Um, uh, we get together once a quarter. Before the pandemic, we got together once a quarter in person. When the pandemic hit, initially we got together like once every couple of weeks um, because we were all grappling with what do we do? And, and we would, the, the forum is, you know, um, we would go around and, you know, you start what we call a go round, which is one CEO would just ask a question to the group. And by the way, there's 30 roughly that are part of this group, but only sort of 15 usually are part of the session, right? With people's busy schedule. So it ends up usually being a group of 10 to 15. You go around and you share stories about um, how you're tackling things. And so each CEO asks one question, and this usually takes us a couple hours to get through. They just have one, we go through around, around the whole room. Each CEO asks one question and gives a situation they're grappling with and asks for advice from the others. And the others then add their, their advice. Then we normally move on to um, a case study where one CEO will get up and present a challenge or a problem they're grappling with um and by the way all this is um you know confidential and there's just a, an understanding nobody shares anything that comes out of that room especially some of these many of these companies are public so there's you know material information that uh in there so you, it's very confidential and um and 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 we present a case study and then everybody gives uh, their input into it. And usually the case that it has to ask for advice. It's got to be, you're at a fork and you've got a decision and it's A, B, or C, or some variant thereof. Um, so others can boil it down. And then the last thing we do is we'll hear outside speakers. So, you know, we've heard outside speakers on investment strategies, on psychological safety, on building teams. You know, we'll, we'll we tend to bring in experts and, and do that. And I, I found it very helpful. And, How long have um, you been been a part of one of these? And what is there I've a been name, part of name this for group? probably um, for probably three years? Oh, um, cool. It's the New England Technology Forum, um, um, and um, and it also has um, it's got a group in New England and a group in um, Silicon Valley, oh. um, and it has functional. Uh, air, uh, groups too. So there's an HR group, which Alice Clark, my head of HR, is part of. So she does the same thing I do, but just sharing with HR peers. There's a um, product group, 
that I believe Jamie Buckley is part of, um, and I think they meet in Silicon Valley, and they they and he's our chief product officer, and they share stories um, about what other uh, chief product officers are doing. So it's a way of trying to keep current with what others are doing, and it's also a group you can lean on for help. Yeah, it seems like it'd be extremely valuable. Um, to you, Mike, hey, you, you recently were, uh, I think won a, a, an incredible award or you were, you were on a list. Um, the, the best CEOs for diversity, according to employee reviews, and you were ranked number nine in the world, uh, one spot behind Tim Cook from Apple, uh, an extraordinary, um, award to, or a list to be a part of how did you feel when you saw that you were you were ranked number nine in the world when it comes to the best ceos for diversity according to employee reviews yeah well i felt like to be perfectly honest i didn't really deserve it um i felt like the organization had done a lot of work um to really um help uh, leadership recognized that a lot more needed to be done. I felt like we were probably behind the curve. Um, and so, you know, I was surprised to see my name there, but um, I was, I, I feel like our organization does, um, has, has come a long way in this, in this regard. Um, particularly, uh, you know, we appointed Rhonda Moore to be our head of diversity and inclusion. Um, She's done a, a fabulous job, I think, try, uh, advancing the ball for us and getting us further down down the path here. But I think I think you know we have a lot more um, to do. One thing about the Lexus Nexus business, I think that that um, is is special in this area, and I think it's it's why we have a unique um, place in this in this um, arena is that our core purpose, as you know, from the days you worked in LexisNexis is to advance the rule of law, mm -hmm. right? And that's something every single employee understands, they appreciate, they feel, and they bring it home into what, what they're doing. And, you know, part of the mission of advancing the rule of law is to create equality for all under the law. That's sort of the first principle that we, um, apply when we think about advancing the rule of law. And of course, the fight against systemic racism is just endemic to that mission. And so I feel like we we have a, a, a real role we can play in the products that we produce, in the help and support that we provide for the courts, um, in the legal community, um, you know, in um, we've, you know, put out resources that helped um, peaceful protest, uh, peaceful protesters, um, so they could get access to uh, the right resources. Um, we have um, supported um, organizations fighting systemic racism with products um, that help them advocate for themselves in courts um, for free. Uh, so, and and we've we've now taken our product roadmap and put a diversity and inclusion overlay on that and said to ourselves, where can we move the needle in this area and where can we be effective and help? Um, so I think that that's a, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, nice place that we can make a contribution mm -hmm. and many contributions are needed. You know, success has many authors and if we're gonna make progress in this area, we have to have many authors. Um, yeah, I, I want you to think about briefly the members of the, the CEO kind of group that you're part of. When you have these meetings, you have uh, regularly for the past three years. And Mike, I love studying people who sustain excellence. And you're certainly one of those people and you're surrounded by others who have as well. When you have to tease out and think of the common behaviors and actions of those people. What have you found to be some of the common themes, common behaviors among those who are sustaining excellence? You mean uh, the people on the, in the CEO group? In yeah, particular, yeah. The or, or others that you work with, but yeah. Yeah, certainly. yeah. You know, it's, uh, first of all, I, I find this group to be, they're very good listeners. Um, they care. Um, these are people who, 
you know, I had a, I had a problem, I had a challenge. I won't <laughs> disclose exactly what it was, right? And I needed help. And so I went to this group and asked, you know, for help. And, you know, about, I don't know, a, a good handful of them just devoted their time to me. And this is totally apart from the normal series of what we do to spend time working through my, the challenge I needed some help on. So I you know, presented the materials and they went back and forth. So they, I was just so surprised at how they were able to volunteer their time. They're good listeners. They care about people, um, which is, it's amazing. These are very busy people and you come into the room and it's like they have nothing else in the world, but to focus on you. That's a, that's a characteristic I've, I've, I've noticed uh, with these folks. And then the other thing that I would, would call out, and I've, I've always been very impressed and blown away by, by this with, with um, this group, and by the way, with, uh, with others, for example, our, our, our chairman was somebody I would point out at, uh, at Relics, you know, who's retiring now. They're, they're incredibly busy people. They've got so many things going on, but they really know how to manage their time effectively so that they don't seem frazzled, they concentrate on a few things that matter. They know how to allocate their time. And when, you, when you're with them in the room talking about any particular thing, they're 100% present on that matter. And that's, that's something I found, the ability to be, to be present and focused common among, among these people. It's always, uh, always inspiring to me. People probably are trying to meet with you constantly. And I would imagine you have to say no a lot if you're trying to get anything done and, and, and you want to be present for the people that you are with, like you are here with me right now. Is, yeah. How is that for you? How, how hard is it having to say no or to manage your schedule? Uh, I would imagine you have help from, from others, but I, I still think if, if, uh, if we're up to other people, you would be meeting from 6 AM to, or maybe earlier to, to, to midnight every single day. Cause that's how much time people want of you. How do you manage that? It's, it's one of the most important things to do and one of the hardest things to, to get comfortable with. I, I'm not sure if people ever get comfortable with it because you're right. You have to say no all the time. I mean, you, 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 you're constantly saying no because the, the universe of things you could be spending time on is infinite. The number of things that you really need to be spending your time on is a few. And so sorting out the, you know, the universe from the few is so important to be able to do. And like I said, you know, I think the most common characteristic I've seen among these people that I've talked about is they are very, very good at that. And, and I think that, um, you know, one thing I try to do is I try to just have reflection points, you know, on weekends, reflection points in the mornings when there's quiet time, really around all right, what are the most important things I should be spending my time on? And is my time being allocated on? So I'll go through my calendar. And yes, I do have, you know, a great uh, assistant, Melissa, who helped schedule this session. Um, and she'll, she'll, help, she'll help work with me. But what I'll try to do is constantly be saying to myself, is this where I should be spending my time to have the biggest impact I can have? Yeah. And, and just constantly reprioritizing and filtering out um, stuff. The other thing I'll try to do is I'll try to plan out over the course of a year where where I should be spending my time. This this I, I mainly did pre-pandemic back when I was traveling around everywhere. I'd, I'd start with, all right, you know, where should I be, where should I be spending my time physically? And I, I would just plan it out. So my whole schedule would be planned at almost a year in advance um, in terms of how much time I was going to allocate to Asia? How much time was I going to allocate to Europe? How much time was I going to allocate to um, Raleigh, North Carolina, Dayton, Ohio, New York, um, California, or some of our major locations? And then I would I would plan it out, and then you know try to adhere to that. Of course, you always have to shift gears and change when priorities come up, and that's natural in business. But if you can just constantly step back and say to yourself, okay, where is my time? best spent. Um, I found that to be helpful and useful. How much do you miss the travel? <laughs> Great question. Um, I miss, I certainly miss it, but I, there's some things I don't miss about it. I, you know, I was traveling 
all the time, right? I was probably traveling, I don't know, 50, 60% of my time, mm-hmm. something like that. That's a lot. There are people who travel a lot more than me. Um, but I look back on it now and I feel like it probably was too much. And, and now that I'm in this new world, I realize how much I can accomplish without necessarily having to do all the travel. Now, for me, I'm lucky because I've been in the business for 10 years as a CEO. So I know people around the business. I've got relationships and it's not, you know, if, if I were coming in new, you really, I think, have a hard time without, without doing the travel. Now, because I know people, it's easier to manage without it. I think probably, you know, the, the right number for me is probably more like 25 to 30 percent when I get back um, into a, when we get back into full swing. I do miss the interaction with people. Um, I miss the collaboration sessions, the innovation. I miss being out in the field with customers. Um, so I miss I miss a lot of that. I'm, I'm, I'm quite anxious for that to come back. But we want to retain all the great things that um, that we found in this in this new world. I, I do remember one time early when we were both traveling, Mike, uh, I had been fortunate to win a circle of excellence trip and I was in the Atlantis and I found myself behind the line for the water slide. And you, it, the guy in front of me was you, I think you were with your son. I believe <laughs> I was really nervous. I didn't know what to say. And you were just like, like, just like another dude, just, just having a good time, right. Going on the water slide. And I remember thinking, Oh, uh, he seems like a good guy. And I was all nervous of what to say to this guy because he's a CEO, but you were just like another dad having a, having a good time with his son on, on a water slide. I, don't know. I, re- I remember that incredibly vividly. Actually. Really? Wow. I, I remember that. Yep. I re- yeah. So yeah, I was with my son, Devin, oh. and we were, we were about to go in the, um, in the, the thing that the, the slide that goes, it just yep. shoots straight down. Yep. And Devin walked up to the, um, you know, to the, uh, you, you sit on like a platform and they open up the platform and you just, you shoot straight down, you know? So he walks up there and he, and he gets nervous and he's starting to have second thoughts about whether he's going to do it. So then he turns around to go walk away. And who does he see? Ryan Hawk and AJ Hawk, two <laughs> huge football players with rippling muscles standing there, right? They're kind of looking down at him. Like, um, if you walk away from that platform, you're never going to hear the end of it. So then he just turns right and back around, goes up and shoots straight down. I did not know that part of the story. I just remember him going down the slide and you, you being the dad there, like any other dad, it was great. That's great. Well, there's a lot more going on there, right? Oh, okay. Hey Mike, one more question. Uh, then we got to run, but there's, um, for the person who's a new, new college grad, your son is, is going to graduate college in a few years that wants to be the CEO of a company someday. Um, and they want to make a big difference. They, especially for Lexus is, is such an incredible company. I've told you before we started recording how it's just, just, it's made my life. I'm so grateful for the people and the company and certainly you and people that work on your team. But, um, what is some general pieces of life advice you would give to someone who is a recent college graduate who has strong ambitions to grow and, and lead and maybe even one day become the CEO of a great company. Yeah. So I guess my advice is going to, it's going to sound like a platitude, um, but it's, I think it's so true, which is do what you're interested in doing. Don't do something because people tell you it's something you should do. Don't do something because you think you need to do it for your career. Follow your passion. And that sounds you know, generic, but I really found, you know, um, it, that people who are the most successful are ones who are really enjoying what they do. And there are people who are the wrong fits in some places. Um, you know, I, I took a, you know, I started my career in, in a much different path and um, it took me a little while to figure that out. And as soon as you figure it out, then you start to, you start to take off and you start to flourish. So I would say, don't do something because your parents want you to do it. Don't do something because you're told by, you know, the school that this is um, how you're going to make a lot of money. Do something you're really interested in doing and you're passionate about. And over time, you're going to be successful in it. And if that leads you to be a CEO, that's a great thing. But there are many, many great things you can do and great jobs um, that um, you can be a great artist, a great musician, 
Um, you know, there's there's a lot of great paths to happiness and success. The CEO job uh, is not the only one. It's one for some people who like to do that, but uh, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, great advice. And I just, again, want to say thank you uh, for uh, leading the company where I got my start and I owe so much to because I really learned what it meant to work um, and the culture that is at Lexus is um, just forever grateful for, for being able to be a part of it. Uh, I've met so many good people and friends and people that were in my wedding, uh, met my wife. I mean, all these great things that happened uh, because of Lexus Nexus. So I, I'm, I'm forever indebted to, to you and the people that work uh, on your team and, and have so much love for, for, for Lexus, man. Thank you, Ryan. I certainly feel that. Please pass on my regards to your wife, your yeah. family, your parents. I will. Uh, we miss all of you guys. Yeah, I, we will. I will. I'm so glad we got a chance to, uh, to catch up, Mike. Thank you so much, man. All right. All See right. You, Ryan. All right. Bye.